I'm Dr. Mila Brujic, and today we're talking to Dr. Steve Sorkin on caring about the cone in keratoconus patients on the OI show. Dr. Steve Sorkin, welcome and thank you for being a guest on our show. Steve, for, for those in the audience that may not necessarily um, know a lot about you, give us a little bit of your background, where you practice, where you went to optometry school, and what you spend the majority of your day doing. Sure. Thank you, Miele, for uh, the invitation to uh, participate in this podcast. It's a big honor for me. Um, I am in a cornea anterior seg practice in Fairfield, New Jersey, a uh, practice called Corneal Associates of New Jersey. I graduated from SUNY, and uh, I've been in this practice for about 12 years, more than 12 years now. And my day is pretty much limited to cornea and anterior segment. Um, so I deal with uh, pre predominantly specialty contact lenses and managing uh, various cornea diseases. So, Steve, you kind of, you really spread through the spectrum of corneal disease, in particular when it comes to keratoconus. I know that you're a big proponent of understanding this condition early and catching it early. And tell us what that process looks like in your practice, because I know that there are eye care providers that they're referring into you to say, hey, Steve, you have the technology. Let's rule in or rule out keratoconus in this individual and tell us some of the technologies that you're doing to determine whether or not that patient. Sure. So I, I see patients from, you know, new diagnosis all the way through transplants. So we sort of manage from the beginning to the end. I probably see at least 10 to 12 keratoconus patients per day. I mean, it's, it's a big part of my practice. So, um, you know, more and more I'm getting referrals in from outside docs, uh, ODs or MDs that may not have the technology or at least have maybe just has the awareness that a patient may have keratoconus, maybe their Rx is changing, they're developing more myopia, more astigmatism, their Ks are increasing, maybe they know something on like lamp exam, or perhaps they're not 2020 corrected anymore, their, their, their soft torx are not working. So they'll come in to see me. And the first thing we do, obviously, is do a history, see if they have any family history of keratoconus, uh, the eye rubbing, seeing if they have a uh, you know, it's a parent asking their child if they are an eye rubber. Um, and then obviously we go into the testing, looking at their RX, uh, see if we have any uh, data from previous exams to see if that has been changing. And then we, of course, the, really the gold standard in at least the United States is doing a panic cam. So really you need to have that tomography with an M to evaluate the back surface of the cornea, which is really where the first changes will be noticed, even if you don't see anything on the front surface, which is a placebo based uh, technology. Um, those early cases, like how frequently are you noticing that where you're seeing that posterior float changing without obvious changes on the anterior surface? Like how frequently is that? Is that 10% of the cases? More, much, much more, much more than that. Yeah. I, I think that having that, that back surface uh, evaluation is very important. And the Pentacam also has a, um, a suite called the Bell and Ambrosio Index, which basically is almost like an artificial intelligence based uh, program that'll kind of screen out for keratoconus. Obviously, it's not 100% perfect, but it's really a good uh, indicator. And then there's also metrics to so sort of follow them over time. So, uh, you know, again, those patients that are sort of borderline, we, we kind of have that ability to follow them, you know, see them every three to six months, depending on their age and their progression, uh, to determine if, uh, you know, if treatment is necessary, which is typically collagen cross-linking at this time. And I know, Steve, that you talked a little bit about family history. And I know there is more discussion around genetics within mm -hmm. the eye care space. Um, are you doing anything to further kind of isolate those risk factors as well? Yeah, so there's actually a genetic test now by a company called uh, Abilino, which is called the Avagen test. So we've used that a lot in our practice to help screen for keratoconus. So it gives you a risk score from zero to 100. And you kind of have that as another metric to determine if they have keratoconus. I've seen some patients in the office that have six, six, six and a half diopters of sill. We look at the topography and the, the pentacam, and it kind of looks suspicious. Uh, maybe they're not exactly 2020, they're 2025. And we've done the genetic test on them, and it's been a very low. I actually had one that was zero. So they had zero, you know, zero genetic risk at all. That doesn't mean that they won't develop keratoconus, but you can kind of feel a little bit better about how frequently you want to you know, manage them. They'll still need to be followed up regardless. But again, if that number is low, you can feel a little bit better and talk to the parents about that. But if the number is very high, you may be much more uh, uh, apt to um, you know, refer them out for cross-linking and have that done sooner rather than later. With the advanced technologies we have, I see this like, you know, this kind of 
old guard uh, prevalence data of keratoconus being in the population mm -hmm. about one in two thousand patients it's just it's it's not true i mean no. better diagnostics as we understand the genetics better we're realizing those numbers are much more prevalent than we than we thought it was would you agree with that agreed i mean there's a, there's a new studies that have out that have come out and some that will be published very soon that actually put that risk of maybe one in 80 and even one in 50. So it's a much, much higher prevalence than we think. I think that's because we're much more aware of screening these patients and also the technology that we have is much better than it used to be. You're not relying on retinoscopy and, uh, and, and a, a manual keratometer anymore. You have all these other devices and, and, and ways to, um, to track these patients. Well, Steve, you know, with these patients, when you identify them, one of the first things that we're doing with them, even with the more advanced cases is you're questioning whether or not they're corneal cross-linking candidates, but you're, you're, you're working with specialty lenses with them. Um, sure. Any clinical pearls around specialty lenses, things that we need to be thinking about as clinicians or practitioners, or things that you've seen like really kind of advancements in the way that we're fitting certain specialty designs? Sure. Well, I think, you know, scleral lenses are kind of a hot topic now, and I, I really love doing sclerals, and I'd say, you know, a uh, vast number of my patients are in scleral lenses just because of the practice you know, uh, situation that I'm in. But I, I always tell clinicians when I, when I lecture and I have students externs in my office and they're kind of amazed at how very, very diverse my uh, treatment is. I mean, I, I don't discount any other types of, 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 uh, of, of lenses. So there are specialty soft lenses, there are keratoconus soft lenses, there are corneal GP lenses, which again are, are kind of falling out of favor, but they definitely have a place in specialty lens practice for sure. Not every patient can and should be wearing a scleral lens. So there, there's definitely options, hybrid lenses also as well. So I like to give, you know, give an option for patients. We discuss all the different options based on anatomy, topography, previous history, dry eye, um, ocular surface, all that stuff, uh, obstacles. There's definitely different ways to approach the management of these patients. So not, not scleral lenses for everyone, which is kind of what a lot of people are doing now, I think it's it's not not the best thing for every patient. Yeah, Maybe a controversial a little bit, but that's the way I feel. I'll tell you, Steve. I, I think we have a number of tools and technology. We I just saw one of those patients earlier today. Um, she was a small diameter or corneal GP lens keratoconic patient. She's had cataract surgery, but she's one of these eye squinters, and still she's seventy years old, but she has mm -hmm. a difficult time holding her eyes open, even to get her GP lenses on or corneal GPs on. So really having the discussion around scleral lenses for her is almost a non-existent discussion. Mm -hmm. And she does extremely well with those. That's One of the other topics that I wanted to pick your brain on, because again, you're, you're doing cornea pretty much all day and you're side by side with other optometrists that are working with you. You're side by side with other corneal surgeons that are working side by side with you is the, 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 the corneal transplant patient and really kind of what's your strategy initially with that patient if they do require refractive correction? Is it a small diameter GP? Do you go hybrids? Do you go scleral lenses? What's that, what's that initial kind of gut response where you're saying, all right, this is the lens we're gonna start with? Yeah, I think, you know, again, my, my you know, discussion about scleral lenses, I think they're wonderful. And in a lot of patients, it's the only thing that will work for them based on their uh, their topography, their, their RX. But um, if I could, I would do GP lenses first, if I could. And that, again, depends on a lot of different factors. But physiologically speaking, you know, there's some, some risk doing scleral lenses, um, hypoxia, um, you know, uh, suction, uh, things of that nature. So if I could do a GP lens and patient can tolerate it, it stays in their eye properly, um, I think it's definitely a, um, a win for the patient. But unfortunately, sometimes that, that doesn't happen. Um, but I strategies if you say, okay, we tried the corneal GP, it's really not working on this patient, mm -hmm. this transplant patient, and you say, all right, the next step is the scleral lens. Mm -hmm. Are there any kind of key considerations that you're taking into account with that penetrated keratoplasty patient that um, maybe is a little bit more uh, important in that type sure. of central corneal clearance, the, the materials that you're selecting? Sure, for? yeah, exactly. So, you know, the philosophy for that is if you can try to get it as close to the cornea as possible, that will allow more oxygen to get through. Um, the materials we have now are much better. The DK, you have 180, even 200 DK now. So you try to maximize the oxygen uh, transmission. Um, you know, if you can 
you know, sclerolins obviously supposed to, you know, stick to the, to the sclera, but in some cases, if I could make just a little looser, just allow a little bit of space so that maybe a little bit of tear exchange gets through there, as long as it's not fogging, you know, causing midday fogging or awareness, uh, I think that's helpful if at all possible. So not the exact full seal on the conjunctiva sclera um, is definitely helpful for those patients. And then Steve, I know too, like, you know, when we're talking about central corneal clearance or just corneal clearance in general, that one to 300 micrometer range is kind of always what we're sh mm -hmm. generally shooting for. What, what's your goal with the penetrating keratoplasty patient? And what is that like, you know, 10 minutes after the patient has the lens on versus, you know, towards the end of the day? What, do you have a goal that you're kind of shooting for there? Yeah, I mean, during the diagnostic fitting, obviously, we know it's going to settle usually in the first couple hours, three to four hours or so. Um, so typically at, at initial fitting, maybe 200, 250, if we can get that down to even 100, 150 for a transplant patient, if it's possible, that's really my, my goal, if, if at all possible. But we know that grafts are not going to be 100% smooth. So there's going to be elevated areas, particularly at graft toes junction and, and such. So you want to, you know, you may not be able to get that ideal uh, clearance, you know, uh, you know, consistently across the whole cornea. But um, I think that uh, if you can get it as low as possible, I think that's, that's a good thing for most patients. Steve, this was awesome. This was really insightful. And it was uh, really cool to talk to a practitioner who's really, you know, all day, every day, all you're working with is corneas, specialty lenses, hand in hand with corneal surgeons. And I, and I, I really think that a lot of these tools and tips are insightful. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And, and thank you all for joining us on this episode of the OI Show.